So this first talk, um, I'd like to, to show you some work we have been doing over the last few years on uh, iron biomineralization by um, bacteria. And um, so I'll show you what are we, interest, uh, we are interested in such uh, bacteria. And I'll show you how we studied uh, such processes at the nanoscale. This is really the grail we have uh, when we study geobiology. Um, and these are basically the motivations. Um, we now think that life has contributed to shape the Earth. We know that microbes are everywhere at the surface of the Earth. Uh, we know that they have been here for a long, long time. Uh, we don't know exactly when they appeared, maybe 3.8 billion years ago. We, we, we don't know, but probably they were around for more than uh, several uh, billion years old. And uh, we know that they can catalyze many reactions. Basically, if you consider uh, the Mendeleev uh, classification, you can pick any element in that table, any chemical element, and bacteria can do something with them. Um, so, so this is what um, really made people think that life had a major, a significant impact on the geochemistry of the Earth. And this is a funny question you can ask. Of course, we have no answer. But then think about all those programs, those uh, special programs from the NASA or uh, Europe or any country, um, when they are exploring planets in the solar system or outside the solar system. What would be the fate of a planet without life? Imagine you can just do the movie again on the Earth. Just keep the life from the beginning. What happens? Would uh, the Earth look like that nowadays? And this is just a fundamental question, in my opinion. It's definitely a far-reaching goal for our science, but this is basically what the, the big motivation, I think, in geobiology. So I'll be brief on this, but we know that microorganisms can form minerals. They can produce minerals, and this is how partly they impact these uh, geochemical cycles. And uh, I have few illustrations here. Um, you can see uh, this one, for example. This is a transmission electron microscopy image of a section of a micro, uh, of a microbial cells that precipitated uh, calcium phosphates. And those calcium phosphate associated with microbes, we know that they can be involved in some calcification problems. So definitely this is of interest to some uh, medical scientists. Uh, if you want to understand how you can get rid of this kind of calcification, then you need to know the processes involved in this biomineralization. This is a picture of a, a mine in the south of Spain. This is the Rio Tinto uh, mine. This is a huge, huge mine that has been exploited for several hundreds of years. And you see this uh, small lake, or it's not that small, but this spread of water. And there's a water coming out from here. This is a river, coming, the Rio Tinto River. It's a very nice river, uh, nice red color, uh, beautiful. And it's warm over there, it's south of Spain. So basically, if you go, I was there, I think it was in July and very hot, very warm. And so you really want to get a, a bath in the, in the river. Problem is, it's pH 1. Uh, a lot of metals and heavy metals. So yeah, not a good idea to, get a, to swim in this. Um, at the same time, there, there are many microbes populating this river. And these microbes form minerals. And these minerals trap the heavy metals. So basically they contribute, and I'll show you one specific example, they contribute to remove the pollutant from the water into the sediments. And so um, 
if you look at biomineralization processes, this, uh, this is a way to bioremediate these pollution problems. This is a picture of what we call um, bonded iron formation. This is the biggest uh, sedimentary deposits of composed mostly of iron and they have been exploited and they are still used uh, for, uh, as a source of iron. They formed several, million, several billion year, uh, years ago. So they formed, uh, let's say, around three or two billion years ago. We don't know exactly how they formed. There are several models that are proposed, but one of these models or two of these models involve microorganisms. So again, there is a belief that these huge sedimentary deposits might have been formed by microbes. Those, you might know them, and I'll talk about them in the second talk. Uh, these are stromatolites. We know stromatolites, so again, they are just rocks composed of carbonates, but we know them nowadays here, for example, in the Shark Bay in, in Australia, and they are populated by microbes, and we think that microbes contribute to their formation. The thing is, we also find this kind of rock in the geological record back to 3.5 billion years ago. And the belief is that microbes, these stromatolites, are among the, the oldest traces of life on Earth. So if you want to look, to search for traces of life in the past, again, microbes and minerals from microbes might be important. And finally, this, this is a transmission electron microscopy, and I know there are some specialists here of this kind of bacteria. Um, so this bacteria, have, so this is a bacterium cell, and they form these things here, these tiny minerals uh, within the cells. These minerals are magnets, and so they form intracellular magnets that they can use to feel or the, the, the magnetic field, and they can move along the magnetic field. And um, the interesting thing here is that such magnets are very interested to several technologies. People have tried to synthesize such magnets with very specific sizes, specific chemistry, and so on. And definitely nobody has been ever able to produce Magne such magnet as beautiful, as good as the one produced by the microbes. So now if you think about studying these microbes and how they form these minerals, you might have some clues of how to produce them for our technologies. So again, you see that the formation of minerals by microbes is of interest to very diverse communities, scientific communities, from medical scientists to geologists to environment, uh, environmental, mineral, uh, whatever, uh, chemists, and, um, and, and physicists. Okay, so um, my, I, I will focus today on, on, on this question, what is the role of microbes of bacteria in the iron, in the redox cycle of iron? This is very, very uh, simplified geochemical cycle. Uh, you can find iron-3 at the very surface of the Earth, where you have oxic conditions, so you have oxygen. This iron-3 can be reduced by microbes into iron-2 when there is no more oxygen. So when you get to anoxic environments, you get to iron-2. And then this iron-2 can get oxidized back to iron-3 by microbes. Of course, iron-2 and iron-3, that's fine for a chemist. If you are a mineralogist, and, that's, uh, and a chemist as well, um, you, might, you want to know what phase contain the iron-3. There's a huge diversity of mineral phases that can contain iron-3. There's a huge amount a diversity of mineral phase that can contain iron-2, and there are even mineral phases that can contain both iron-2 and iron-3. And this makes a big difference regarding the, the whole thermodynamical 
functioning of this system. What you can see also on this picture is this. When uh, basically when you um, it's uh, sorry, uh, there is a mistake in that picture. This should move here. Um, it, w those iron three phases, they contain many pollutants, heavy metals. And when you reduce the iron three into the iron two, iron two is soluble, so you release all those pollutants. So when you do this reaction, coming from here to here, you tend to release the, the pollutants. When you go from here to here, you, can to tr you tend to trap the pollutants. So again, it's not only about the iron cycle, it's also about the cycle of many other elements. This is one quick example I want to show you to illustrate this idea. This is the Carnules uh, acid mine drainage river. Um, this is in the south of France, and this is how it looks like upstream. So this is close to a mine tailing, um, and this is how it looks like. So the, basically, the, the, are, the mine is close by, there are some tailings, and they are uh, weathered by just rain. And um, then this produces a lot of iron, a lot of heavy metals, and you end up with this kind of nice colors, yellow, yellow and red colors, and this river contains arsenic at this concentration, 300 milligram per liter. It's really a lot. <laughs> it's really a lot. But you can, I mean, kids can play around, there's no fence. So, uh, okay, whatever. Um, if you go down the stream, just, let's say, one kilometer down, this is where you end up. Um, this is the Carnula stream, so it will converge with another river. And if you collect samples here of the solution, the arsenic concentration is down to one milligram per liter. As you can see, I mean, you have uh, people <laughs> culturing <laughs> some salads, things like that. So, and this is the, the house of the mayor, mayor of, of the city. So basically it looks like it's safe here. But, but yeah, okay. So, you, in, in one kilometer, you lose a lot of arsenic from the solution. And this is well explained because there are many minerals, many sediments that are formed in the streams from here to here. Many sediments are formed and these sediments, they trap the arsenic. The interesting thing is that these sediments are formed by microbes. There are different types of microbes. I will be very general on this. Some can oxidize iron, and by oxidizing iron, they do this. So they oxidize the iron 2 plus into iron 3. They don't touch to arsenic, but eventually we have iron 3 and arsenic 3, and those elements, they combine to form this mineral phase here, tuleite, that we find in the sediments. So this has been reproduced in the laboratory with these kind of strains, with bacteria. You can produce these minerals that we find in Carnules. There are other strains that can oxidize both arsenic and iron. And so they form iron-3 and arsenic-5 phases. And again, it has been possible to reproduce this in the laboratory and form different mineral phases that we find also in the Carnules River. So this is how you explain why arsenic is decreasing in the solution because of microbes that process some redox reaction like oxidizing iron, oxidizing arsenic, you end up with minerals that precipitate and that trap arsenic. The thing is, um, okay, that's a kind of chemical picture of the whole thing. So microbes, they oxidize arsenic, they oxidize iron, and that form minerals. But if you want to get, you, you need to know a little more the mechanism involved in the precipitation of the minerals. Where do the minerals form? Do they precipitate on the bacteria? If they form on the bacteria, what happens? 
imagine you are just a bacterium cell and you're getting trapped by minerals. What happens? Uh, does it work? So this is the kind of question we have. If we look more closely to these sediments from the Carnules River, so these are, uh, this is a transmission electron microscopy, this is scanning electron microscopy. If you look at all these things, we see the cells, we see the, some of the microbes, they are filaments, like this, and we see these globules, all these globules that you see here, that you see here, that you see here. What are those uh, globules? Of course, we can think about many explanations. First, first thing, might say this might be microbial cells. The thing is that they are very small compared to bacteria. And um, so we, we don't know what they are. But one idea is that they might be vesicles, vesicles uh, that might be formed by the bacteria. So this is known now in some studies that some gram-negative bacteria, they can bulge the outer membrane and ex ex expel some vesicles like this. Now if you imagine that precipitation of minerals occur here on these vesicles, this might be a way to expel precipitation away from the cells. Of course this is purely speculative, but what I want to stress on here is that we don't know much about the biomineralization processes involved in these systems. Okay. So that was some kind of introduction to show you some questions and what the implication of that work. I'd like now to focus on one specific problem that we uh, uh, work on over the last few years. And basically the motivation or the whole problem is on that slide. We studied some uh, bacteria that are able to oxidize iron 2 into iron 3 in the absence of oxygen and at pH 7. How do they do that? There are two different possibilities. Some of them, because you need an oxidant, okay, there is no oxygen, you need an oxidant to oxidize iron 2 into iron 3. One possibility is that they use nitrate, so they are nitrate reducing bacteria. So you feed them with nitrates plus iron 2 and they oxidize iron 2 into iron 3 and they reduce the nitrate and we'll see in what form they reduce the nitrate. First possibility. There are a second type of bacteria, second type of metabolism, the uh, phototrophs. So those ones, you feed them with CO2, iron 2 and light. And so they oxidize iron 2 into iron 3, they reduce CO2 to organic carbon and that's it. Um, so you see this is uh, an oxygenic photosynthesis. Problem with this bacteria is that, is that they produce iron 3 and it's pH 7. pH 7 iron 3 is completely insoluble. So this is the dilemma I'm talking about. They might use this reaction as a source of energy. They use the transfer of electron from iron 2. But at the same problem, at the same time, they form a very insoluble phase and that might be lethal for them. We observe two different types of strains. Some, like this one, BOFEN1. This is a scanning electron microscopy image. This strain, the cells get trapped, get entombed by the minerals. They encrust and they die. This one, SW2, um, they don't get encrusted by minerals. Minerals precipitate away from the cells. What makes the difference between those? That's the whole question. That's the whole motivation we had. Why some of them manage to precipitate iron-3 outside of the cells and some of them precipitate iron-3 within the cells? Um, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't have the answer. <laughs> But at least I'll show you how we get a little more carefully into the processes involved. And of course, I'll, I'll propose you some hypotheses. So here are the questions we ask very specifically. Where is iron 2 oxidized compared to the structure of the cells? Is it within the cells, within the cell wall, outside of, of the cells? 
where does iron-3 precipitate? It's not exactly the same question. Iron-3 is very insoluble, but you might oxidize it somewhere, and you might precipitate it somewhere else. How does the iron precipitation affect the viability of the cells? I won't show you some results about that point, but that was one question we had. So, you see, this is the kind of question I'd like to address with you. To answer, to, to get a little more into uh, the description of these uh, systems, we used such a technique, which is fairly new. Um, this is called scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. This is basically, this is a, a transmission microscope. And the light source that we used are X-rays. So we used X-rays. The thing is that those X-rays, they are produced by a huge facility. This is a synchrotron, so it's a kilometers wide. Um, but so that's a huge bulb, right? That is a huge light bulb. So the synchrotron. So this synchrotron produces X-rays, and the X-rays are focused by a lens onto the sample. The sample is here, and the spot is something like 20, 20 nanometers. And we detect the, the X-rays that go through the sample. So this is transmission X-ray microscopy. And to get an image, here we only have a single spot. So to get an image, we scan the sample in X and Y. So this is a scanning transmission. So that's why we call it scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. So these microscopes gives you images, and the spatial resolution of the images is around yeah, 20, 25 nanometer. So that's nice compared to the light microscope. And at the same time, for each pixel of this image, we get what we call X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy. Um, so this basically, this is we measure the absorption of X-rays. This is absorption of X-rays, the number of X-rays that are absorbed versus the energy. We can tune the energy of the, the incident light and we can measure the absorption versus the energy. This gives you spectra. These spectra, they have peaks. And these different peaks tell you something about the chemical composition of the element. And I'll show you that later on. So this is some kind of basic explanation of it. What we probe here is just some movement, some displacement, uh, movement of electrons from one orbital to the other one. So the peaks correspond to the energy of the orbitals of different elements. And the energy of the orbitals depends on, on the, um, the, the environment of the element. So let's say, for example, I, I skip on that. Okay. If we move from an energy to another one, first of all, we can discriminate carbon from nitrogen from, from oxygen. Very basic, area. many techniques can do that. But now look at this. If we look at, we, we sit here at this energy, 300 electron volts, but we, we look at different carbon molecules. So we have uh, these aliphatic chains, and this is the spectrum. Now if we have aromatic carbon, this is how it looks like, and you see it's completely different. So we can discriminate carbon from other elements, that's one thing, but we can also discriminate carbon in aromatic from carbon in aliphatic or carbon in carboxylic. So we do really the functional groups. And if we move to an energy up to 700 around here, this is what we have, and now we can measure a spectrum on iron 2 or iron 3, and you see they are different. So with this spectroscopy, we can discriminate iron-2 from iron-3. And remember, we can do that at the 20 nanometer spatial resolution. That's very uh, powerful. Okay, so now we have the cultures of these microbes that oxidize iron under anoxic conditions. We need to um, measure uh, this uh, at the synchrotron. We want to measure the iron-2 and the iron-3, so we want to keep it away from the air, the air, otherwise there will be some oxidation of the samples. So we prepare all the samples in glove boxes where we have a controlled atmosphere. So this is technical, it's not interesting. So let's start with these cells that precipitate minerals away from 
the cells. So this is the SW2 strain. This is an alpha proteobacterium, a rhodobacter. And this one does not increase and, and does not increase. And this is a to illustrate this ID with this Stixon, this scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. So we can start with taking an image, and you see the cell here, and there are some kind of filaments at the tip of the cell. Now we can map the organic carbon, and organic carbon is both on the cells and on the filaments. Now if we map the iron, you see that there is no iron on the cell. Iron is on the filaments. So this is just an illustration that those cells manage to precipitate the iron away from, from them. We can, the, the, so the iron precipitate are on the filaments, and the filaments are composed of organic carbon. We can measure spectra on the filaments, and we, we can understand what this spectrum means by combining the spectra of reference compounds like lipids, polysaccharides. And basically what we see is that those filaments on which iron precipitates are composed of lipids and polysaccharides. While the cells, they are composed, as you see here, this is the spectrum of a cell, they are composed of proteins, mostly. Of course there are some polysaccharides, of course there are some lipids on the cells, but we mostly see the proteins on the cells and in the filaments we mostly see lipo, uh, so lipids and polysaccharides. So these filaments that nucleate the iron minerals are lipopolysaccharides. Second, we can look at the iron redox state on the filaments. As I showed you previously, iron 2 and iron 3, they have different spectra. You see iron 2, there is a major peak here, iron 3, there is a major peak here. Now if we measure the iron, the spectrum of iron on a filament after four days of culture, this is how it looks like. You see, there are two peaks. And so this spectrum is a mixture of this one plus this one. So we can calculate the amount of iron 2 and iron 3 on these filaments. We can do this with time, with this one, from three hours there is already some oxidized iron, but it's mostly iron 2. And after 11 days, it's basically mostly iron 3. So iron gets oxidized. The most interesting thing is here. If we take, so this is a cell, this is a cell, there is a filament here, there is a filament here. Now we measure the iron redox state from here to here. So we plot this iron redox state as the, the amount of iron-3 over the total amount of iron. So basically how much iron is oxidized. And we go from the cell away from the cell. And you see that the iron redox state is not the same here and here. There's a gradient. Iron is more reduced here than here. There's more iron-2 here than here. So there is a gradient. How do we explain that? We don't know, but we can have some suggestions or some hypotheses. First possibility, there is diffusion of iron-3 away from the cells. So the, the cells, they oxidize iron-2 to, to iron-3 within the cells or within the cell wall, and then the iron-3 diffuse away from the cell. Problem is, chemically, we don't know that process.